Hi, everyone, and welcome to our GDJC talk. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Casey Mitchell, who is, a, who is currently a postdoctoral intramural research training awardee within the obesity and diabetes clinical research section at Phoenix, AP, uh, epidemiology and clinical research branch. And her current research include the uh, examining respective um, the influences of dietary and micro and microbial uh, metabolites on human health through diet and exercise intervention, particularly amongst indigenous populations. And today she would be co-presenting with Emma, who is a biostatistician interested in nutrition and, and metabolic outcomes. <clears throat> So Emma would be, Casey and Emma would be talking about metabolic responses to a mixed meal tolerance test in individuals at high risk of type 2 diabetes. So over to you, Emma and Casey. Thank you for the introduction, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. So um, as Camille mentioned, we'll be going over the metabolic response to a mixed meal tolerance test in individuals at risk for type 2 diabetes. And I just want to give you all an overview of what we plan to cover in this talk. So we'll cover some background information just to make sure um, everybody has the same knowledge as a starting point before we go into the study design and the statistics, and then talk about the results and some takeaway messages for future research. So as we all know, type two diabetes is widely recognized as one of the most prevalent global chronic diseases and comprises numerous modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. And research over the last two decades is heavily focused on ways in which risk for type two di diabetes development may be reduced or mitigated, including lifestyle interventions and medications. But to date, lifestyle interventions are unanimously considered the most effective at reducing risk and severity of type 2 diabetes. Modification of dietary intake is of particular interest in a research setting and in a clinical setting. But we know that um, dietary intake is one of the hardest uh, modifiable behaviors to influence due to um, the environmental impact on dietary intake. So that could be things like socioeconomic status, uh, location that somebody lives, availability of food, um, and things like familiarity with food and taste preference. But beyond improving dietary quality and the inherent benefits that has on cardiometabolic health, there's also an interest in modifying dietary intake to promote weight loss. But what we know from research is that individual response to dietary modifications for weight loss is highly variable which has ushered in individualized weight loss plans and the field of precision nutrition. So precision nutrition aims to use multidimensional data from analytical computing platforms to provide targeted recommendations to individuals based upon um, a clustering of factors like DNA, lipid profiles, and glycemic control, which is an important regulator of cardiometabolic health. So previous research has noted the importance of measuring postprandial glucose and insulin responses to substrates like lipids or glucose to determine variability and how that may increase or decrease risk for type 2 diabetes. Historically, we know that oral glucose tolerance testing has been the clinical standard for diagnosing and categorizing changes in glucose metabolism and glycemic phenotype, like impaired fasting glucose versus impaired glucose tolerance. And while fasting blood assays are used in a lot of clinical diagnoses, most people are predominantly in the postprandial state or the fed state during waking hours, which means something like a mixed meal tolerance test would mimic daily intake more closely and could be a useful nutrition tool for providing not only information on glucose tolerance testing, but also other physiologically relevant information. And although mixed meal tolerance tests are routinely used in clinical research, their utility in clinical research compared to an oral glucose tolerance test for type 2 diabetes risk has not been well studied, and especially in the context of precision nutrition. So the aim of the analyses that Emma and I conducted were to assess the association of glucose and insulin responses to a mixed meal test, 
compared to an oral glucose tolerance test. And then secondarily, and what I think is most unique about our analyses was that we have the data to determine whether or not a mixed meal test compared to an oral glucose tolerance test can actually predict the onset of type two diabetes. So here's just a quick slide. Um, challenge tests based on carbs, lipids, and proteins or combinations have been designed to temporarily disturb the body's homeostasis. And in response to dietary stressors, we know that the body will strive to restore homeostatic balance, usually within a matter of hours. But the extent of the disruption and the speed of recovery to baseline or homeostasis are health indicators. So we can see that very clearly in an oral glucose tolerance test when we see the glucose and insulin kind of return to more of a baseline level. Um, but we know the development of a challenge test, like a mixed meal test, is sufficiently sensitive to measure subtle changes due to food interventions, and it's a key step towards biomarkers of health. So in this context, a large body of literature has been published using different metabolic challenge tests to assess health status and the effects of different interventions. And we can see here that a metabolic challenge or a mixed meal test can actually target the gut, the brain, pancreas, liver, muscle, systemic stress, endothelial function, and adipose tissue. Whereas a glucose tolerance test is primarily looking at uh, liver, and muscle as those are the primary sites for glucose uptake and then pancreatic function because of the insulin secretion. So now that I've given you all a basic background information, I'll go on to the study design before I hand it over to Emma. So for the study design, we had 501 indigenous Americans without type two diabetes at baseline from a longitudinal cohort study assessing the pathogenesis of type two diabetes. And of these individual, these 501 individuals also had baseline mixed meal tolerance tests and oral glucose tolerance tests. So our four hour mixed meal test consisted of 40% carbohydrates, 40% fat and 20% protein. And then was 30%, so that meal, that mixed meal is 30% of the daily calculated weight maintaining energy needs that the individual needed. So as you can see here, this is a scaled dose that factors in body size. And then for the oral glucose tolerance test, that is a 75 gram glucose beverage and um, irrespective of body size. So it's a fixed dose. Um, participants also had measures of body composition and underwent intravenous glucose tolerance testing in addition to the oral glucose. And the um, also underwent a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. And for the purpose of our analyses, we used the acute insulin response from the IVGTT and insulin action abbreviated as M that we can get from the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. Uh, type two diabetes was measured at each follow-up visit and the follow-up visits were approximately two, every two years during which diabetes was determined by an OGTT or a review of medical records. Thanks, Cassie. Um, so how do we quantify this meal test responses? Um, so essentially the plasma, glucose, and insulin responses to the mixed meal test, uh, we quantified them by the total as well as the incremental area under the curve, which are going to be abbreviated AUC and then IAUC throughout the rest of the presentation. We also calculated the peaks, the rise from fasting, and the decline from peak, which is just taking the um, the peak minus fasting, as well as the final time point minus the peak for those uh, rises and declines. And then our primary outcome um, was whether or not the mixed meal tolerance test uh, predicted type two diabetes or did not. Okay, um, so our analysis plan. Um, we reported the descriptive statistics of the baseline characteristics by those who developed type two diabetes and those who did not. Then we ran a series of Cox proportional hazard mod models uh, with the first one being the unadjusted models for glucose or insulin responses uh, predictive of diabetes or not. Model two, we adjusted for age, sex, body fat percentage. In model three, we further adjusted for M, 
And then in model four, uh, our final further adjustment was for AIR and full versus non-full Southwestern indigenous, indigenous American heritage, which has been consistently associated with um, AIR as well as uh, type two diabetes. So these were important covariates to include in our models. Okay, so in this table, we have some of the baseline demographics um, of those who develop type 2 diabetes, which is the plus sign, and those who did not develop type 2 diabetes, which is the minus sign. Uh, so of our full sample of 501, uh, 169 or 34% did develop type 2 diabetes, while 66% did not. Um, and then some other things to note, the majority of our sample was uh, full uh, Southwestern Indigenous American heritage, um, which is important to note. The ages were very similar between the groups. However, the type two diabetes group tended to have a higher body fat percentage at baseline. And uh, the median follow-up time was 8.5 years for the type two diabetes group and 10 point, around 10 years for the group that did not develop type two diabetes. Okay, so um, we graphed out here, you can see the glucose and insulin meal test responses uh, by those who developed type two diabetes and those who did not. So on the left-hand side, we have the graph, which is the uh, plasma glucose at each time point. And the group who developed type two diabetes um, are the black squares, whereas the group who did not develop type two diabetes uh, is the open squares. Uh, so as you can see, the type 2 diabetes group tended to have, on average, higher uh, plasma glucose levels throughout the entire meal test. And then on the right hand is the plasma insulin responses to the mixed meal test at each time point. Uh, these are the means and standard deviations, by the way. So again, the type 2 diabetes group tended to have slightly higher insulin, insulin levels as well uh, over the mixed meal test, which is, a again, four-hour test, which is equivalent to 240 minutes. So we also wanted to graph the uh, glucose and insulin OGT T responses uh, between the two groups because it's a similar test, but slightly different. So again, on the left, we have the glucose responses to the OGTT, which uh, was from zero to 180 minutes, so a three hour test. And again, in the dark black squares, we have the diabetes group. And then in the white clear squares, we have the group who did not develop type two diabetes. And then on the right is the insulin responses. So again, the diabetes group tended to have higher glucose and insulin responses in the OGTT, which is somewhat comparable to the meal test responses. However, uh, the OGTT has higher values in general because it's a 75 gram glucose uh, test rather than the mixed meal test, which is slightly different. So Cassie, you could go back to the other slide. So if you were to plot these together, the OGGT responses would be much higher. Um, it's kind of hard to tell when they're in different slides, but the meal test has slightly lower responses um, in terms of glucose and insulin compared to the OGGT, which is consistent throughout the literature. So we just wanted to highlight that. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so some of our main results. So here we're looking at um, a forest plot of the prospective relationship between the meal test, glucose responses, and type 2 diabetes. So here we have the total area of the curves for glucose, which we mapped out as 0 to 180 minutes, so three hours. And then we also did the same thing for the glucose AUC for 0 to 240 minutes, which is the four hours. Then we also have the incrementals, um, which is essentially just taking out the fasting values um, and consistently also reported in the literature. So um, what does this all mean? Essentially what we found is for the uh, area under the curves, the total area under the curves consistently predicted type two diabetes. Um, as you can see, the, ha the hazard ratios or the little forest plots are all on the right-hand side of this dotted line. Um, which is one. So if it crosses this dotted line, that means it's not significant. Um, but if it's, it doesn't cross, that means it's a significant predictor of our outcome, which is type two diabetes. So as you can see, the totals 
uh, for models one, two, three, and four consistently predicted increased risk of type two diabetes. Uh, the incremental glucose area into the curves did as well, but when you, we added uh, M and AIR to models three and four, uh, these lost significance, which is important to know. Um, so here's just, this is kind of what we're putting in the manuscript. It's a breakdown of what we just showed you, but in a table format. Um, so essentially this is just showing all of the variables in each model um, and their hazard ratios. Uh, we just wanted to put the slide here in case it was, someone was interested in looking at maybe the, how the covariates predicted type two diabetes, but it's the same thing as what we just showed in the slide before. Okay. So here's the insulin area in the curves as well as incremental area in the curves as predictors of diabetes. Again, the dotted line of one, if it crosses that line, it means it's not significant predictor of diabetes, but if it does not cross, it is a significant predictor of diabetes. Um, so insulin models were slightly different. Um, it, most of the uh, res insulin responses, whether there was total or incremental area into the curve, predicted type two diabetes in the unadjusted model one and then model two. However, when we added M uh, and AIR in three and four, these insulin responses lost significance. And here's another breakdown of just uh, how the covariates and the insulin models also were associated with diabetes. Okay. Uh, so this slide's also a lot, but essentially we're showing now, we're gonna focus on here are the hazard ratios for the peak glucoses, the rise from fasting glucoses and the decline from peak glucoses. So we have model one, two, three, and four. Um, and the stars represent p-values less than 0.01, uh, whereas one star represents p-values less than 0.05. Um, and one thing to highlight here with the glucose, uh, the peak glucoses is the peaks consistently predicted type two diabetes. So as you can see in model one, uh, the hazard ratio is 1.59, model two, 1.54, three, 1.5, 1.28 in model four. So only the peak glucose values from the meal test predicted type two diabetes consistently after adjusting for these covariates. Um, the rise and declines did as well. However, in model four, when we add AIR, they lose significance. So the main Takeaway here is that higher peaks predict uh, increased risk of type two diabetes is what this is showing. Okay, and then on the other side of this uh, very large table, we have the insulin. So we have the peak insulins, the rise from fasting insulin and the decline from peak insulin. Um, the insulins were kind of similar to the AUC and uh, in incremental AUCs, uh, essentially they predicted type two diabetes and unadjusted models. But as soon as you added covariates, uh, those took up most of the variance for prediction. So insulin does not appear to necessarily predict type two diabetes from the meal test based on our data. Okay. Uh, now we'll progress into some takeaway messages and then uh, time for questions and answers and discussion. So primary takeaway points from our data so far are that a mixed meal test does predict the development of type 2 diabetes um, the, and that the results were relatively comparable to the oral glucose tolerance test. We know that the total glucose area under the curve was predictive regardless of model adjustments for all the different covariates that we showed you, uh, but glucose was no longer predictive for incremental area under the curves after the addition of uh, insulin action and acute insulin response. Body fat, uh, insulin action, and acute insulin response, as well as indigenous American heritage were predictors covariate predictors across all models for the AUC and IAUCs, which I thought was particularly interesting. And then we know that insulin was predictive in models with age, sex, and body fat. But as Emma previously showed you, the um, additions of MAIR and Indigenous American Heritage uh, were predictors across AUCs and IAUCs, but that this response was attenuated the more that the models were adjusted. 
And um, one additional thing is the peak glucose also consists consistently predicted type two diabetes. So uh, increased uh, glucose AUCs, increased glucose peaks from the meal test consistently predicted increased risk of diabetes. Yes, thank you for that. And then here, this is a follow-up to that slide that I presented in the introduction. So what's interesting here is this research group looked at a phenotypic flexibility test, which was their equivalent of a mixed meal test and how it impacted all the different systems you see represented here in groups that were metabolically healthy versus groups that had a diagnosis of type two diabetes. So the black um, bullet points underneath the, with the black text, those are signifying differences between adults with and without type two diabetes. And then the gray is no difference. So you can see here that as far as pancreatic function, there were significant differences um, in response to a mixed meal test for these groups. Um, the majority of the liver function tests were significantly different. Uh, a fair bit of the muscle and in the gut, at least only GLP-1 was a little bit different. And then we can see in the adipose tissue, all the differences there as well. So just wanna highlight, this is comparing groups with and without type two diabetes, not um, looking at risk for development, but just highlighting here what a mixed meal test, what kind of data a mixed meal test can give us when compared to the oral glucose tolerance test from a research perspective. So for next steps, um, we have several remaining questions and a fair bit of those we're hoping to address with our data set. So we wanna know if the evaluation of a mixed meal tolerance test as a nutritional tool can predict the development of retinopathy, renal function or decline in renal function and overall mortality. Um, additionally, we are curious as to whether or not additional time points do yield useful data and whether or not for a mixed meal test, there could be a standardized cutoff similar to the way we have that standardized cut point for the oral glucose tolerance test. So typically with that test, we see that um, the two hour time point is kind of the cutoff for determining whether or not someone has type two diabetes. And occasionally as in our research, we'll measure time points further out like the three hour mark, but the three hour mark is more for our own information. Um, as far as recovery or a return to baseline rather than diagnostic criteria. And then lastly, we would like to know if the utility of an oral glucose tolerance test versus a mixed meal tolerance test differs. And I think from previous research, we can see that it does, but the nuances of a fixed versus a scaled dose for a glucose tolerance test and for calories from the mixed meal tolerance test are some questions that are still remaining. So what is the effect of that? Um, we do know there's some differences in glucose only versus a macronutrient mix for these tests that are determining metabolic response. And one thing that I do think was interesting that came out of our data is that fat mass versus fat free mass can influence um, risk for developing type 2 diabetes, but then also um, as you can see from the previous research on the slides that I showed you that also can influence um, hormone production. Um, so we're really looking at for fat mass hormonal regulators versus fat free mass, which is our site for glucose disposal. So those are some additional remaining questions we have there. Anything to add, Emma? Uh, no, I think you actually said everything I was. <laughs> <would have said. laughs> okay. um, so. Those are the primary takeaway messages that we have so far. And now we will gladly answer any questions. We would welcome feedback as these analyses are continuing to develop. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open up the floor.